So good evening to everybody who's joining us today for this conversation. Uh, today's conversation is called Emergency Then and Now, and uh, it is the 11th conversation that we are having in the Beyond the Bars discussion series. Uh, this is a series that we have building uh, ever since the wrongful incarceration of our friend and comrade Omar Khalid uh, in September, uh, on September 13th, 2020, alongside several other uh, anti-CA activists by the current government. Uh, it is important to highlight here that uh, the combine of the CA, NPR, and NRC, if brought into full force in this country, would effectively render minorities like the Muslims as second-class citizens in this country. And it is exactly this that uh, these activists were opposing. So essentially, they were just raising their voices for uh, equal citizenship in this country. And that is the crime for which that uh, they have been incarcerated. And it has been more than uh two years for some of these activists behind bars uh, while those who we know are openly propagating and advocating hate and are giving uh calls for uh persecution of minorities and dalits in this country are being rewarded by this regime uh in the same line before we start this conversation i would like to condemn in the strongest possible terms uh, the detention of activist Tista Setalwad by uh, the Gujarat police today uh, from her home. And uh, it seems to be that uh, uh, this detention is taking place precisely because uh, Tista was standing beside all those voices who suffered the maximum impact of the violence of the carnage that took place in Gujarat in 2002. And this is coming in uh, hours after uh, Union Minister, Union Home Minister Amit Shah uh, squarely laid the blame for spreading alleged misinformation uh, regarding his party's involvement uh, in the uh, carnage of Gujarat 2002 uh, on Tista. And uh, we demand Tista's immediate release uh, from this detention uh, under all uh, fabricated charges. It is important that we have this conversation today uh, on the 25th of June, because 47 years ago, on this date, uh, the then government declared an emergency in the country, uh, under which uh, there was a rampant widespread uh, uh, a crackdown that was seen on any kind of dissident voices, be it journalists, be it activists, and it is important to reflect uh, the impact that it had on the citizens back then in today's context when we are yet again uh, seemingly in a state of undeclared emergency and we are seeing a similar sort of pattern in terms of persecution of any and every dissident voices against this government. Uh, for this conversation, we have two very significant uh, people with us. We have uh, Mr. Prabir Purkayasta, who is the editor of one of the few honest and brave uh, channels and media that uh, that remain today, which is newsclick.in, and who was also one of the figures who was incarcerated during the then emergency for confronting the government's authoritarianism. And with him uh, having the conversation, we have senior journalist and author, uh, Mr. Paranjay Guha Thakurta. So uh, I would request Paranjay, sir, to please take the conversation forward from you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Apeksha, for asking me to have this conversation with Prabir. And uh, for me, it, it's uh, it's an honor and a privilege. I've known Prabir for several decades now. I was trying to remember Prabir. I've known you for more than two and a half decades at least. And I've been particularly closely associated with NewsClick as a consultant now for more than four years. And as a picture pointed out, it is perhaps not a coincidence that on the day the emergency was declared in 1975, today is the day that Tista Sitalwad has been detained in Mumbai by the Gujarat police. Before we go into certain bigger issues pertaining to the emergency then and the atmosphere prevailing in India now, Prabir, I'd like you to recall your, your certain personal, uh, uh, I should say, your personal experiences in Tihar Jail, the circumstances under which you were picked up 
by the Delhi police from Jawaharlal Lal Nehru University. And, and uh, I, I've read uh, what Gyan Prakash wrote in his book, Emergency Chronicles. I've also read what you have written that has appeared in Newsclick about the classes of prisoners and you were the better class prisoner. Uh, and, and But I thought maybe uh, many of those who are viewing this program, who are watching you and hearing you, may not have read what Gyan Prakash wrote and what you have yourself written in Newsclick. So maybe if you can briefly recall for the benefit of those who are listening, what was it, uh, the, the, the circumstances that led to the Deputy Inspector General of Police, Mr. P.S. Binder, who uh, thought you were Deva Prasad Tripathi in JNU when you were suddenly whisked away and taken to the heart jail. Please recount uh, the, the events of that day for the benefit well, of the Well, well as you know, this has been sort of repeated time and again as one of the wanton acts that happened during emergency. And also a relatively irrational act because they didn't really know who I was. And it took them at least six months, according to then ADM Ghosh, who told me later. Yeah, after six months, we found we should have perhaps arrested you in any case. But they really didn't know anything about me. And this was in response essentially to Menaka Gandhi, then the crown princess of emergency. And as you know, Sanjay Gandhi was really in charge of Delhi, Haryana, uh, probably UP as well. And it was his writ that ran in Delhi at that time. And uh, some people very close to him. And Binder was one of them, the, the then DIG range, at, uh, if I remember correctly. And also the Lieutenant Governor of Delhi was also... Uh, seemed to be very close to him. But the person that was really close to uh, him in the administration was Naveen Chawla, who later on uh, became the chief election commissioner. But if you take that small coterie who ran Delhi, there were various wanton acts of this kind. P.N. Huxer's uncle being arrested for not having uh, the proper tags. Apparently, that was an act which endangered the de defense on, or the security of India because he was booked under, he was charged essentially in defense of India rules. So, you know, this kind of uh, wanted acts, which is, there is really no and, and, logic. And, and, it's well, a I'm, just interrupting you. I'm just interrupting you. <laughs> Mr. P. N. Huxer happened to be at that particular point of time the personal secretary to Indira Gandhi, and and, and oh, considered. I, I think he was to vice chairman planning commission by that time. He had okay. moved on, so he. But had he a vice of what we read from Jairam Ramesh's book, he didn't exactly support many of Mrs. Indira Gandhi's uh, decisions at that point of time. Yeah, it it was in fact Sanjay Gandhi's again vengeance. Because under uh, P. N. Huxer, when he was the second the personal secretary, I mean not the personal secretary, uh, PMO's secretariat, he was heading the PMO secretariat. He had in fact stopped funding for or uh, government uh, orders for Maruti. He had in fact objected to some of the things Maruti was doing, and Sanjay Gandhi never really forgave him for that. But you know what is interesting is. The personal becomes political in this sense that Sanjay Gandhi, uh, his Maruti factory turns into vendetta against P. N. Huxer. That's why his uncle and his wife was also threatened to be arrested. All of this goes on. And my arrest is Menaka Gandhi being stopped from attending class. Devi Prashanti Party was the person who had stopped her. There were more people than DPT at the, on the spot. And I was still standing there or sitting there in the lawns when Binder, who had been pulled up by Sanjay Gandhi. How come there is emergency? You think every, you say everything is quiet in Delhi? And how is my wife being stopped from entering class? Now, if you remember, uh, that was Menaka Gandhi, Youth Congress and all of that. And she later on became a minister in the BJP government. So... The, 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 if you just look at the larger picture, 
it was really the wanton acts of the police and the vendetta, petty vendettas, which also became an element in the emergency. In fact, that, as well as the, uh, I what, the what is called the Nasbandi, uh, which is the basically the two elements which really alienated post sterilization. Post sterilization is what really alienated the people from the Congress and the emergency regime. And it's interesting that uh, I talk about the Tihar experience because that's an interesting one. I think what is interesting, which I would like to recount today, is also that you know you had two ways of reacting to the jail. Either you decided that, you know, when am I going to get out and think about, okay, what's happening, maybe next month, maybe three months later. Or you decided, okay, we are in for the long haul. Let's not think about it. Let's look at what we can do in the meanwhile. So I sort of decided exercises, health drive. That was, you know, he had a very regular life, okay? And reading Marxist classics, which you could still do in jail. So I had books and I exercised and I had a very regular life. And I do credit the jail, that regular one year of life and healthy uh, exercise and so on, having given me really uh, the health I have for the rest of my life. So I have to give small credit and, 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 to Mrs. And, Gandhi. And, and now you are 75, over 75, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Okay. No, no, so, you know, oh. Prabhupada, I'm just interrupting you. I was going through the chapter about you, which has been written in Gan Grant Prakash's Emergency Chronicles. And, and I came across some very, very uh, sort of unusual, let me put it, anecdotes. ADM Ghosh suddenly uh, finds out that you're a staunch, within quotes, uh, 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 <laughs> member of the Students' Federation of India and, and, and how you allegedly beguiled your, 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 your late wife, um, Ashoka, uh, Ashoka Lata Jain, and, and how, you know, you were sort of, with great reluctance, they sort of allowed you to appear for your interview, for your engineering examination from many jail. And, 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 and of course, how you uh, sort of uh, DPT or, or, or Dev Prasad Tripathi actually joined you in Tihar after you had been there. And, and, and also, I mean, I'm going to ask you some more uh, questions about your experience in Tihar jail. But maybe you can go ahead and tell me, since you talked about the food and, and you said it was better than JNU's hostel food, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about your experience. In yeah, but it's a lot of ground you're asking, so that might take too long. So I'm going to be, be very brief on that. It was the paucity of anything they had on me. And in fact, P. Ghosh talks about it in the Shah Commission hearings, and they really didn't have anything against me. So they had to find something to put on paper, because the paper is very important in government. So the only thing they could say was that I had given a notice, we had given a notice for marriage already. Before, in fact, the same ADM P. Ghosh who signed my finally my visa warrant. So that the only thing they could say is that I had really uh, been romantically involved with Ashoka, who was a well-known activist. And it was due to my political charisma. Apparently, political charisma was treasonous or certainly was a threat to the security of India. So that was really the, uh, the, re the, the underlying issue that it was completely illegal. The arrests that were done, reasons were all fabricated. And whatever was being done was being done because a list had been provided and the police and the magistrates followed the list, mindlessly. They didn't even have to give reasons. They had to write manufactured reasons, which the intelligence branch provided with, uh, I'm not going to go into what is the level or the quality of the intelligence branch and whether it should be called it, the word is the word intelligence, should it be used in that context? But I'll leave that out. So you were talking about the, the food in jail. Yes, the, we, because they the rations in Delhi jail for better class prisoners, as also in UP jail and other jails is quite good. All political prisoners had what is called better class. Now class is very important in India, as you know, we are a very class conscious society. But the food that was given to normal prisoners was extremely bad. In fact, 
I had it for about a week because I was not put in the Misa ward for about a week. So I spent time with the others and the food was really unedible. So that is one. And I had, when I had gone to Allahabad and discovered for my viva, which you talk about, the viva was not because they were kind. It was actually the court order, Delhi High Court judge issued an order, one of the very few orders that were issued against the emergency that I should be taken for my viva to Allahabad. That's what they did it. Whatever the claim was that they were kind and so on, that was not true. It was strictly under a court order. There I discovered the class issues in Allahabad jail. Then when we were transferred to UP, and about, I think, 30, 35 people were transferred to UP jails, uh, after about five or six, five months or six months, at that point of time, I ensured, told everybody, kept in your warrant written that you're better class. The jailer said, what? This is your political prisoners. Obviously, Misa, you will be getting better class in UP. I said, no, you don't get it over there. By Because you're a political prisoner, you have to be given it, and very few people are given it. So we all got better class thanks to my knowledge that there's this is strong class distinction even amongst political prisoners over there. So I think that's about the basic background for it. Okay. Yes, no, no, no. I'm, 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 going to ask, I'm going to ask you to recall two more of your experiences in jail. You know, uh, you talked about the different wards and the different barracks and how you were with various leaders uh, of the Bharatiya Janata Party and the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, including uh, those who are no longer with us, Nanaji Deshmukh, uh, former finance minister Arun Jaitley. But, but you said, you know, the, uh, this food also was a division and not also uh, a, a political affiliation because it came to the question of vegetarian and non-vegetarian food, including... The B word, uh, I should say, buffalo word. Maybe you'd like to tell us a little bit more about that. Well, you know, when I initially went to, I think it was ward number 17, there were two barracks and therefore there were two kitchens. Uh, there's not a common kitchen. And one I found had largely uh, the Jansan and the other had, in fact, a mixture of all other political uh, parties, prisoners, and so on. It, it also had some people who had been picked up like Mam Chand, who was a newspaper vendor who had a stall in uh, Connaught Place. From He was picked up because he had a fight with Arjun Das, the, the Congress councillor, and mainly because, uh, I, I think, maybe I'm exaggerating, mainly I think is a warning to all the news vendors that you better mar mark what you're selling. So he's, but the crime that officially was attributed to him, I mean, the security reason, was Pili Modi's March of the Nation, which was certainly. But, but, but he also sold the organizer of the RSS and he also sold People's Democracy of the Communist Party of India, yeah. Marxists. It's interesting that those were not identified as a reason, but Pili Modi's paper was. And that's what I meant by the mindlessness of all of this. So that was one. And what's the other thing you want? Huh. The food, the other food. people vegetarian, were Vegetarian, non-vegetarian. Non-vegetarian and so on. So I discovered that it was not politics that divided the two barracks as much as the food. Food preference. And some of the uh, Jansan people used to come and eat with us because they're non-vegetarian. But Bulakats used to get buff and so on. And then they said, we can't really handle that. So uh, food, in fact, dominated over politics when it came to who was in whose kitchen. And it came up again when we were transferred to uh, Agra jail. In, in fact, there also, two of us decided we would have to, you know, we couldn't really boycott meat like that. So we started our own kitchen. It was good for us, because at least for me, because I learned minimum cooking over there. Though I must say I was still very bad when I came out of it. But at least cooking was something then you were familiar with. At least the basic theoretical process, because you saw it being done. Okay. And, and uh, for the information of our viewers, this uh, episode concerning the newspaper vendor, Mam Chand, uh, was also finds, finds mention in the report of the Justice J.C. Shah Committee's report. Prabhi, you know, we laugh today and, and we are joking and we are smiling as we discuss this. But there was, I mean, things were terrible. 
And, and in a sense, now let's move a little bit, look at what happened then and what is happening today. You had the maintenance. But before we the... do that, Paranjai, since you're raising it, I think it must also be two things I would like to say in that context. One is that the con the really the fear that was there outside. And that's, I think, very important to understand. People had internalized the emergency. They're not speaking against it. They had sort of taken for granted it's going to be there for some time. And they, all of them, not all of them, but a very large section of the people decided that protests and other forms were out. Not only that, even when we came out of jail, Mrs. Gandhi declared the elections. At that point of time, even among the opposition, the feeling was that we are going to lose should we even participate in elections. Kuldeep Nair, I think, has written about this. And it was only when they went to the people, they saw the response, they saw, they saw the anger in the people, they realized how quickly politics was changing. So one thing that I must take from that is that politics can change very quickly. And therefore, while we should be aware of the reality of what's around us, we should also have that optimism of hope that things can change and things change very rapidly. And then things can change very quickly and the entire political atmosphere and public opinion can change very quickly in very a short period of time. Second you know, thing I is, ask, no, say, I, I want to make another point. Inside yes, jail, the question is, some people broke and some people did not. People who broke or the one who decided that fighting was hopeless and they have to actually somehow seek accommodation with the government through apology letters and so on. A number of them did. Even, you know, uh, Subramaniam Swami talks about people in the uh, Jansang who had done it. Uh, I think the uh, other memoirs are there. On this, but I, won't go into that. I mean, Nurani and several others have written about how within the RSS, within the Rashtriya Swayamsevatsang, it's, it's all, it's, it's Sarsam Chalak. Balasab Dev Devras had written to uh, oh, letters, letters Gandhi. to Absolutely. Mrs. Gandhi. But I'm not really commenting on that. What I'm saying is that it is that which breaks you. When you are thinking of how you shall come out and when you give up the fight, that is when you break. And therefore, the ability to keep mentally, the ability to keep up the fight and see what, to what extent you can. You may not be able to find the way you would normally. If, for instance, everything was hunky dory, if you had normal processes before that, you had it before you, Mrs. Gandhi's emergency at that time. So, giving up the fight is what breaks you. And that's why I'm bringing this up that when we talk about what is happening today, the important part is each of us may have different ways of fighting what we think is wrong in society, in what the government, in the administration today. But if you give up the fight, then you break. And I think that is a very important element when we look at what is happening today and what is it that we still need to do. Okay. I think you made an important point. Uh, the To keep up the resolve, to mentally not be broken, to, to remain optimistic, not give up the fight. I wanted you to draw some comparisons between what happened then and what's happening now. We see a certain trend in the use of laws to detain people without trial. MISA, the Maintenance of Internal Security Act, was enacted in the 1971. And that time itself, people said, uh, um, it's the first step towards a dictatorship. If I remember correctly, it was Atal Bihari Vajpayee who used that word. But then we've seen different avatars of it. We, we saw the, the Terrorist and Disruptive uh, uh, Activities Act in 1987. Then we saw the Prevention of Terrorism Act, POTA, in 2002. And most recently, of course, we have the UAPA, the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. And we have seen how, you know, no, I mean, it, it's so arbitrary uh, and that people are being detained for very, very long periods of time, well over a decade. You are aware about the protesters against the Citizenship Amendment Act. You know what has happened to uh, those who uh, are incarcerated uh, in the so-called Bhima Koregao case. What are the similarities and the dissimilarities? Well, again, one can write a long uh, treatise on that. So I'm going to uh, 
uh, be very short. You see, there are strong similarities in some way, but strong dissimilarities also. Let's talk about the dissimilarities first. The Congress used the administrative largely, the administrative machinery. The Youth Congress participated, particularly if you remember the Bengal experience, the Youth Congress was already a uh, goonish uh, brigade in uh, Bengal, well before it appeared in the central stage, Chhatra Parishad and the Youth Congress. But when you talk about the emergency regime, it was really the police and the administration that was mainly in play. Youth Congress had a sway. Yes, it was trying to capture the Congress party. It behaved on various occasions. Arjun Das and Manchand case is one of them. But nevertheless, it was still not the major element in the emergency. So emergency was largely the administra administrative structure. It was also the use of income tax. It was also, if you remember, the threat for the uh, Indian Express building. So various other laws were also in play, but largely it was the maintenance of Internal Security Act and Defense of India rules, which were used against the political activists. That was one. Only uh, George Fernandez and his uh, fellow uh, organizers were charged with the Baroda Dynamite case, if you remember. But apart from that, most of the uh, charge sheets or the orders that came was on these two counts. So there was not, a, there was no major mass organizational backing on the streets or in different localities on the emergency against people who objected or known to be other political party uh, figures and so on. So it was in that sense something which was centralized to the administration and the mechanism that the, the government administration had, the police and various other agencies. And let's not forget income tax also in those days. But when you come to the current one, what you are seeing is apparently those kind of laws like MISA and Internal Security Act are not being used. After all, uh, the, the avatar that we now have, the UAPA, was also something that uh, was brought in by the Congress. It's also true that the Enforcement Directorate and the PMLA, which is also the other instrument being widely used against uh, various people, including opposition party leaders, that if you take all of that, that these were all acts which existed in the statute books before the BJP came into power. So the real issue is that what makes it different is the will to use it against political opponents, A, and B, what uh, Apeksha was also talking about earlier, changing the complex of society by which you start creating citizenship of two kinds. Those who are acceptable as citizens by virtue of ABCD, largely the religious and the ethnic identity. And the other is really those who are not identified as such, who are outside the pale, therefore of your citizenship, if not officially, at least physically, factually, or in other ways. So this exclusion, which was very much a part of Indian society earlier in terms of caste, is being recreated in terms of religious identities, but caste is not going away. And the third, very important, is also women. To create a space in which women would be slowly squeezed out, at least for marrying from their own choice. So the, 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 uh, the campaign on love jihad is also to make women much more subvers subservient to the parents. And that's what the uh, object is. So it is anti-women as well. So it is also looking at caste, but differently, at least trying to uh, get some of the leaders of different castes also into BJP or support the BJP or BJP supports them in different ways. So notional change is there. Some recognition is there, but as far as Muslims are concerned, you can see there is no, no single uh, leader of the BJP today who is a Muslim. And even those who are seem to be slowly being eased out because that phase seems to be over. So what you are saying in parliament, in UP assembly, BJP does not have Muslim faces anymore. 
So all of that means that you are really getting into a scenario of long-term social re-engineering. And okay. that is something that did not happen during the, that emergency. Okay, so, so you, you were saying one important marker that distinguishes the emergency of 1975 to 77 to what we are going through over the last few years, certainly the last seven or eight years, is that, yes, we have authoritarian rulers, we have authoritarian regimes, but the communal angle, the majoritarian angle is what distinguishes what is happening today with what happened in the mid-70s. Am I correct? Yes, that is, I think, a very critical element. And to go to the flip side, there's always a flip side. Flip side is we still can access courts. We still are putting up, you know, resistance in terms of uh, even today. Indian Express is writing about Tista's arrest. And that is there. Okay. It is not like emergency that you couldn't write any of this, these things in the papers. Uh, if you remember that how I think uh, one of the editors had talked about D, uh, what is it, Dem, Dem oh, dot This was put in the classified crazy. column. Huh? Yeah. The the D -E -M -O -O crazy died. Right. Yeah. So this is do Daughters Were Hope or something. And I, I forget that yeah. very famous yes. uh, uh, act that was done as a defiance. And I think the editor still had to pay a price for that. But what I'm okay. saying is those were the subservient acts we could do, which are very minor. Today, you still are able to speak. News Clear still runs for as long as we can. We will. And uh, there are other platforms, even if we don't, other platforms are there. Social media is at least providing some outlet, though there are various restrictions on it. But all of it taken together, I will say, yes, Things in some sense, the social engineering is some dangerous to the long-term fabric of the country. But at the same time, there is a form of resistance. And as I said, the glass to be irrespective of the level of water in it is always half full. So I'm an eternal optimist on that count because half as I come half back half to my proposition, we have to be okay. what we are and fight whatever we believe in so that there is hope in us. And okay. Of course, I, I, I have I, I have a few more questions to ask you, uh, but I came across a very very interesting parallel in an article that I was reading, which appeared uh, uh, earlier in the day. Arvind Narayan writing in the leaflet, he points out, and I never really put two and two together, that during the emergency, one of the people arrested was an 82 year old man. His name was Bhim Sen Sachar. He was the first chief minister of Punjab. He went on to become a governor of Andhra Pradesh. And uh, his son is also well known. He was the late uh, Justice Sachar who headed the Delhi High Court. But it's interesting that he draws a parallel between Bhim Sen Sachar's arrest during the emergency and what happened to Father Stan Swami, who was 82, 83 years old. And he, in judicial custody, he passed away. And, and uh, so, in a sense, the you're not discriminating on people's age and their health condition. It's just that the big is you are considered to be an enemy of the state. Well, Bhim said such an, of, of course, Kuldeep Nair has a very nice story about him that when he was put in the same ward, Kuldeep Nair was also, as you remember, arrested during emergency. And uh, Bhimsan Sachar was his father-in-law. So Kuldeep thought that he had come to see him in jail. So he didn't realize at first that he had come not to see him, but as a fellow inmate. To be, again, this is the difference between emergency then and now. Bhimsan Sachar was released. So all this issue uh, did play a certain role. And the courts were about to also, at that time, Delhi High Court was about to free Kuldeep Nair when he was released. So, yes, some similarities. But I think with respect to this administration today, I think what you were seeing is the normal channels that operated, that, you know, you could talk to the administration. Somebody could talk to Mrs. Gandhi, maybe, and uh, get some relief. 
let's take the other other flip side of it. Pian Haksar family was uh, followed by income tax uh, after the initial Defense of India rules, not providing tags for uh, price tags in the shops. And the price tags were for something which was inside a cupboard. So it was not for public display anyway. But leaving that out, from that it went to income tax. And uh, again, the income tax, if you read uh, uh, Mrs. Haksar, Urbila Haksar wrote a book about it. It's available on the, on, uh, on the internet. So if you read that book, you will see how petty that administration was and how much the political forces were also employed because Sanjay Gandhi was involved. So it also depends on who was involved in that. Is it Sanjay Gandhi? Is it some other person today in the administration who wants to settle scores with whom? So all of that you have to think also when you look at parallels. So I would say, yes, some parallels, absolutely. Some differences also. As I said, those I think are marginal because they affect individuals. What's much deeper is the societal engineering chains that are being sought to be made. And that unfortunately have much deeper uh, consequences for the country. Not just for what is the constitution and so on, but what happens inside our societies. What happens with the pe people. You see, if you look at, at that time, most communities, most places, communities stayed together, the villages. They all lived together in the same, same mohalla, same areas. They met each other over each other's festivals. Slowly you see the physical separation taking place. And those are the social engineering effects. When you don't know, your neighbors are no longer people who have a different religion. Over a period of time, what happens to those communities? I think that's what I'm really okay. worrying all about. Right. All right. Uh, but Praveen, you mentioned this in passing. I'd like you to elaborate a little bit about the, the way the judicial system worked, worked then and the way the judicial system is working today. Now, once again, we know that it was a very short while after the High Court, uh, in the Allahabad High Court judgment uh, on Indira Gandhi's election, when her election was declared void, uh, that the emergency was declared. We also are aware, and you are surely aware of Justice H.R. Khanna, the dissenting judge in the very well-known ADM Jabalpur case, which was in 1976, and how eventually he was denied the, the post of the Chief Justice of India. Who remembers the man who became the Chief Justice of India, A. N. Rai? But everybody remembers Justice Khanna because, in a sense, he and and after him, several judgments and several the Supreme Court itself has acknowledged his kind of seminal contribution to strengthening the judiciary. So, how would you compare the judicial system then with what we are seeing today? Would you like to comment on that? You know, that I think is a far more difficult exercise to talk about what is happening to the judiciary, what happened to the judiciary then and what's happening to the judiciary now. Let's also recognize judiciary then or judiciary now consists of human beings. And if the threats, what are perceived as the threats, appear to be, well, I will not get after my judgeship, I will not get anything else. I will not go to the next level. From a district judge, I will not go to the high court. From the high court, I will not go to the Supreme <coughs> court. What are the kind of implications? What are the kind of things that can happen? There are also possibilities, misuse of different uh, aspects of administrative powers. And all of that has an impact on the judiciary, just as it had on the judiciary during Mrs. Gandhi's period. What, what we do see is that there are still people among the in the judiciary who are giving judgments which I think are fairly bold judgments. There are judgments which I find very problematic. But as I said, I am not a legal expert. Neither am I okay. somebody who can talk about it. But it does, you have to also accept that if this is slowly the uh, temperature of the country, if people think that this administration which is there, this system which has come into being, it is a re-engineering of the social society of India. Then what or how people make compromises in all, in all fields. You can see uh, today what's happening in Maharashtra. As somebody had said, the ED pressure is too much on us. Okay, 
though if you see all of these kind of pressures income tax ed various other pressures which are being put which is what the opposition says then you can see the defections not only money but also these kind of things posts positions all of these again all of it is in public domain what is being discussed what i'm saying is the judiciary is not going to be free from that so oh. when there is pressure on different organs of the state as well as on different sections of society some will compromise some will not those who will All not right. like justice khanna will be remembered those who will will be forgotten but as uh, you know uh, kane said this is what happens in the long run but in the long run we're all dead you know dead. so that is the problem okay so we can put that is the problem okay uh, pravin let me come to a slightly a different theme and uh, my friend pradeep kumar dotto and i have written about it about a year ago uh, this issue of what sometimes people call aesthetic authoritarianism sanjay gandhi wanted the walled city of delhi to have a new look and he had with him the then lieutenant governor jag mohan to support him you know what happened in tarman gate we we can come to that uh, in a different context again but again we see the building of the central vista of parliament and the banaras ghats being re, quote and quote redeveloped the motera stadium being named after prime minister narendra modi this thing about you know these monuments or or leaving a mark for posterity in the the the, the architecture in the buildings uh, would you like to comment on this well as you know architecture is not a subject i would claim any authority on but this is something which has been sort of talked about in the context really of both germany and italy with this monumental architecture that for instance uh, both hitler and uh, mussolini favored mussolini in fact the aesthetic when you come to it's more about italian fascism than about nazi germany the ja germany had focused on autobahns if you remember you know so big highways so yes this monumental architecture seems to be something which uh, authoritarian fascist states both have seemed to have favored in the past does it reflect itself on the uh, landscape today i think yes the imagination that is there seems to be again uh, trying to build monumental architecture for remembering but again you know this is what i had written i think about patel statue which was being built a long it a huge statue which was built which patel would have probably disagreed as a complete misuse of money which should be used for productive purposes you are very strong on that as a strong gujarati with a sense of business he would have said this is a huge waste of money shouldn't be done that was one of his uh, uh, major points he had in life but i had written at that time what is shedis ozamandias that no statues fall people live and i think that's something that we have to remember statues monumental architectures are forgotten people don't remember who built them but people people will live and i think that's something which we have to understand that all of this is not going to last too long society will revitalize itself for you and me the question is will we will we be there at the time or not but that's i think a very selfish personal issue not a large scale historical or social issue okay probably let me draw another set of parallels and i'd like your comment on it yes there was centralization of power then there is centralization of power now there in in the homes of those belonging to the minority community the muslims they were raised in tarkman gate today we are seeing different kinds of so called bulldozer justice being rendered whether it be in alabad now renamed prayagraj or in delhi in, in the northwestern part of delhi we also see a kind of contempt for institutional procedures and institutions as themselves would you say that these are very very similar uh, what we saw in the mid 70s and what we are seeing today 
You know, Jagmohan is held to be, of course, the villain of the Turkmen Gate. He could not have done it without the backing of Sanjay Gandhi, for sure. But he is held to be the chief actor over there because he had this issue about raising all of this in order to create the resettlement colonies. Resettlement colonies shifting the poor out of Delhi so that you could do real estate development as well as other things in Delhi. That was his this thing. And he also said that Turkuman Gate Muslims should not be settled in one place because I have not demolished one Pakistan to create another. Those are his words at that time. And it's not surprising that Jagmohan, who was a close confidant of Sanjay Gandhi, also went finally into the BJP. He joined the BJP, as did Menaka Gandhi. So that's the other part of it, the politics of this. And Sanjay Gandhi's almost falling out with the mother was also because of his views on capitalism, on the world and so on, which is, I think, uh, it's there in uh, Piyandar's book. He has written about how he, she was very disturbed about it. So there is this right-wing uh, viewpoint which Jagmohan had. So the question was, why was he in the Congress or why were, did he become such a favorite? Those are questions I think Congress also historically needs to answer. But there is no question. It's the same person and the same imagination that gets into what would be called, you know, clearing of slums. The bulldozer Raj then, but the bulldozer Raj now is actually different in one particular way. It is targeted against protesters. So if you protest, then your house is bulldozed. So this is what is essentially was pioneered in Israel, actually, against the Palestinians that this, your house will be demolished, a punitive punishment on the community and the family. If your family, your son does anything, your house will be demolished. So the punitive punishment by the state is, I think, what makes it completely extrajudicial. And what is in, when you raise the point about the judiciary, uh, this is something which really bothers me, that this is something I think the judiciary should take a more forthright stand than they seem to have done. Because this, by all accounts, is something which cannot be accepted under any rule of law. And that's what a number of people have written, including senior ex-judges who have written to the Supreme Court, saying that you have to take into cognizance that this is not something which is happening because of violation of building laws. This is happening where the person has been targeted, considered as an activist, or has been named as somebody who led the protest. And then his house is being broken. Even if it is not his house, it belongs to his wife. So all of these things, if you take into account, yes, this is one question where I find that the Supreme Court should have you know, protested, intervened much more effectively than it seems to have done. Yes, to stop the uh, demolitions in Delhi at the last moment, that's true. But at the same time, the punitive punishments that are being handed out with the bulldozer as a symbol of justice today, is something I think that, that is one issue more than even UPA cases in which, as you know, one of our colleagues, Gautam Navlakha, is in. I think I will hold the judiciary far more responsible on that count because that's something they can and uh, they have every reason to intervene on legal grounds. Okay. Let me try and draw one more set of parallels. Shock and awe. Suddenly. Take decisions suddenly. The idea is to get, you know, a benefit, political benefit out of it. Let me give you a few examples uh, from Indira Gandhi's regime, well, from the late 60s, early 70s. Nationalization of the banks, its banking system, the privy purses, abolishing of the privy purses, to forced sterilization, to the declaration of the emergency itself. These were taken suddenly. The whole idea was to surprise. Now we see Mr. Narendra Modi, our prime minister, doing this over and over again. Whether it be demonetization of in November 2016, uh, I beg your pardon, uh, yes, November 2016 demonetization, to the sudden enactment uh, of the farm laws using the ordinance route, Article 370, 
pertaining to Jammu and Kashmir and the harsh lockdown, the sudden and the extremely harsh lockdown in March of 2020. Are there any parallels? Do we see any similarities? That who the those in power, they are exercising their authority by taking sudden decisions and uh, decisions aimed at shocking and putting people into awe. You know, I think that here I would distinguish between the form of taking the decision, the suddenness is a form in this particular case. The content of the decision is what does it do? In the form of taking the decision is also whether it has gone through the processes that a state demands, which is if it is a law, not an ordinance, but it should be a law. If it is a law which has significant impact on the people, whether it is Jammu and Kashmir or whether the farm laws, then it needs to go through the processes which have been set up, the what is called the parliamentary committee process. So I think I would focus really on that. The privy purse abolition, not giving time to the princess, doesn't really bother me. Okay, Nationalize of the, nationalization of the banks, it is an executive decision which lay within the power of the state, just as unfortunately demonetization is within the powers of the state. And yes, they can do it. They can be... There can be acts which are stupid, there can be acts which are intelligent, there can be mediocre acts. The suddenness of these decisions is not what really, uh, I, I would say, is the common element. The common element is in this particular case, of course, when you talk about the declaration of emergency itself, violates the processes. That's well held now, that it did violate the process. Even the cabinet had not met. Before uh, Fakhruddin Ali Ahmed signed the declaration, it met post Fakhruddin Ali Ahmed, the president's signature. So forms are, I think, very important because forms allow certain process, processes which are important to happen. In this case, it did not. In the case of farm laws, it did not. In the case of Jammu and Kashmir, uh, constitutional uh, change that was done, it was basically, it did not. So those, I think, are the content of the change rather than the form. But yes, all decisions may not be made public and there may be reasons for it. So I'm not going to go into that. And which decisions are in that, which category, I think is, a, uh, is something that I haven't looked at. Maybe you would have better idea about it. But the fact that any decisive person in governments take decisions is not my problem. The problem is some decisions have to be taken Collegially. Some decisions have to be taken following the processes which have been well set up. Some decisions have to be taken in consonance with the constitution. Now, if those are not followed, then yes, of course, we need to see. Uh, we need to protest. In Mrs. Gandhi's time, yes, some of those decisions which she took, particularly the emergency itself, those are decisions where basic norms of the, of the, of the constitution were violated. And the basic processes are violated. Yes, of course. There, I think we would draw parallels. But on certain other things, I would not, I would not, by itself taking a decisive step, I don't think I would object to that uh, so much. All right. I have three questions. And since we don't have that much time left, we'll have three concise answers from you. We've seen how from time to time the Bharti Janta Party, the, the ruling regime, they, they make these noises that emergency was very bad, very bad. It should not have been done. And then they keep comparing the emergency. Um, I mean, they keep criticizing the emergency. But when you look at Prime Minister Narendra Modi, he, has, he and his supporters have been far more critical of India's first Prime Minister, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, than his daughter Indira Gandhi. And is, is that a coincidence? Or, 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 you know, some would say that there was certain something similar, similar, the, the authoritarian streak in, in the two was something similar. And that could be a reason why uh, Mr. Narendra Modi is relatively, relatively soft on Indira Gandhi in comparison to Jawaharlal Nehru. Your views. I think Mrs. Gandhi's basic policies were in the economic domain. 
And that had been overturned already by the U Congress, the UPA government, uh, Manmohan Singh as the finance minister, Narsimha Rao as the chief prime minister, and later on Manmohan, Manmohan Singh as the prime minister. So in that sense, that legacy had already been overturned. So he didn't really have to do much about it, except that if you want to take on that she was a victor of Bangladesh, Pakistan against Pakistan, Bangladesh and so on. There he didn't really want to go. But when it comes to Jawaharlal Nehru, if you understand, Nehru was the, perhaps the most hated person in the RSS ever because they disagreed with everything he said. And the, I think the most important part of why they did, they hated him so much because India was at that point could have flipped either this way or that way. After all, if you remember, uh, the partition took place. It's the most bloody event probably of the entire 20th century, except the world wars. Okay, So if you take that into account, the dislocation, the hatred that was unleashed by both, uh, you know, both Pakistan and in India post-partition. It was only in that sense, Jawaharlal Nehru's stature and his belief in a secular India, and of course, the kind of support he drew from the people that did not allow this to happen. And of course, the RSS uh, did not really succeed, particularly after Gandhi's assassination. That was a turning point also in Indian secularism. So they have never really forgiven Jawaharlal Nehru for three things. One is non-alignment. Their understanding is Christians, Jews and Hindus against Muslims and communists. That was their worldview. And then Nehru had a different worldview, which was colonialism. And of course, that we need to build India into, according to him, a socialist republic where we have a pub, strong public sector. And that I think was very important for him. So this was a secular economic part. And of course, the last part, he was not only secular, he even talked of science, science that we should have a scientific outlook towards the world, which is what, is, uh, is what he uh, used very uh, why, oh, often. The, talk about scientific temper, which means having a scientific outlook towards the world. So I think these three things, I, I think, are something which the uh, BJP really ideologically hates. And that manifests itself into its foreign policy, in its internal policies, and also its belief about science, that science is infinitely malleable doesn't matter what science uh, might have said earlier. If we tell it to say, yes, these things happen, then these things have happened. The truth and, is and, what and, and if I can add something to what you say, Nehru's magnanimity. Don't forget that before the 51-52 elections, uh, he he inducted Shama Prasad Mukherjee, the founder of the Bharatiya Jansang, into his uh, cabinet, I mean, along with several of his quote-unquote political opponents. Okay, but I, I have one. Let me make this my conclusion, concluding question. I, hey, I have to defer on that. Nehru also oh. dismissed the first communist government in Kerala. You must know. Of course, he did. Don't yes, that. I know. Okay. Okay. Right. All right. We can agree to disagree on several issues, but that's. Uh, I, I wanted to just ask you to sort of close your comments and and um, make a few more comparisons. Indira Gandhi, after the emergency, after she lost the elections in March 1977, and before she returned to power in January of 1980, she apologized. She apologized that she had made mistakes. Now, we can quibble about whether that were genuinely felt or not, but she apologized. I'm not aware if Prime Minister Narendra Modi has ever apologized for anything. Even when he said uh, about the farm laws, he used the word shama. It, it was like in the context that I'm asking you for forgiveness because I couldn't explain to the farmers why these new laws would benefit them. So this issue of willing to accept your mistakes, apologizing for uh, the mistakes, would you like to say something on that? I mean, we know both have normalized a certain, both had, Indira Gandhi had and Mr. Modi has normalized a certain authoritarian culture. But again, when you look at similarities and dissimilarities, how would you uh, compare that period in time with what's happening today? And you can close your remarks. And, and then give I, us your closing remarks, yes. I think 
the comparison and the differences, what are similar, what are dissimilar, one can really go on long on that. The main issue to me is that we have entered a different phase in our history. And therefore, the personality of Mrs. Gandhi and the personality of Mr. Modi is not what is central to this, these two emergencies. What is central to these emergencies is how do we keep a space for dissent? How do we keep a space for democratic opinion? And how is it that we can put forward our views and struggle for what we think is right under both conditions? That is what is similar today and then. What is dissimilar is what we are fighting against. And I think that is, that is something which during Mrs. Gandhi's time, we were fighting for constitutional rights today and then it is common. But we did not have the kind of social engineering we are seeing. Uh, that I think is qualitatively what is new and which is something that we have to address. And I don't have anything to say uh, in terms of how it has to be fought. I think society, young people, it's creative. It's creative in a ways that we don't, uh, you know, we don't or we cannot predict. And I have belief that whatever happens, a healthier society may take time to emerge, but it is something will happen. Just as somebody, a famous scientist Galileo had said about the movement in the solar system. After decanting, recanting on whether the sun is a center or the earth is a center, he came out and talked about Earth. It still moves. So I will say that we are in a similar situation. Whatever people may believe, movements will take place, society will change, and healthy society demands that we have love and not hate for each other. I think that will, to my mind, as well as a scientific outlook, to quote Nehru's scientific temper, will prevail. Only problem is the Keynesian one. How long will it take? Okay. Thank you so much, Prabhu. I mean, we've been talking to each other for a little more than an hour. Thank you for answering all the questions in great detail, your personal experiences, as well as looking at the bigger issues that have been thrown up as we talk today. It's been same day in 1975, the country changed. We'll wait to see what kind of changes will happen in the foreseeable future, in your lifetime, in my lifetime, surely. So I hand, it, hand uh, the proceedings over to Apiksha. And I, I thank all of you, everybody who's been listening to our conversation for being here with us. Apiksha, over to you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you to both of you for uh, holding this extremely important conversation today. And uh, I would also like to thank everybody who joined us in uh, participating in this session. And looking forward to see you in the next session. Thank you so much. Thank you.